So as I was telling some of the folks uh, before six o'clock, I am going to go through uh, the lecture material for week 12. If it goes well, I'll also do the lecture material for week 13, uh, which means you'll have everything you need for the last two labs, um, which also means that you guys will have one week off from lecture. So that's a net positive for everybody. Uh, so today's lecture might go for a little bit longer, but you'll get a lecture off at the end as a reward. So, you know, it's it, it's good for everybody. Uh, I'll still be here because I have to be here. Um, but you guys don't have to if I get through today. So today we are going to start talking about actual programming the database. Um, so usually what I do with this, these two lectures is I go through the entirety of the lectures and then I'll do a demo uh, next week, um, just so that the lecture content is dealt with and over with. Um, so often when people say, oh, I'm a database programmer, what do you do? I write SQL. No, you're not a database programmer. You know how to write queries. Uh, database programming is actually writing code that resides inside the database. Um, so specifically when we talk about that, we talk about uh, store procedures and functions. Um, and also triggers, which is technically next week's lecture, but we'll probably get it done today. Um, so a stored procedure. A stored procedure contains a sequence of SQL commands that are stored in the database. They're not an external file. They're not in a bash script. They're not, you know, in a Python script. They're stored literally in the database server. Um, and you can later call it. Uh, they're pre-compiled, so that means the when you create the store procedure, the database server figures out the best way to execute it and stores the execution plan as part of the store procedure. Uh, it behaves like a script. You guys have learned how to program in Python. You know what a script is. Um, have you guys learned Bash yet? Bash scripting yet? Okay. Or PowerShell? Um, great. So... You know, in Python, there's a couple different ways of writing your scripts, and there's the most basic one where, you know, it starts at the top, it runs, and it ends at the bottom, and there's no objects, there's no... A store procedure is similar to that. Uh, it does not return a value. It runs, and it does not return a value. It can include pretty much every major SQL statement, like insert, update, delete. Basically, all the DML stuff is included in that. Um, it has input and output parameters, which is different than returning values. Because, uh, you know, like a function in Python returns a value, right? It has parameters coming in, but it returns a value. And it can only ever return one value. It might return an array, but technically it's only returning one thing. It's returning an array. Um, Stored procedures can actually output multiple values. So there's in and out parameters. Um, it can call functions. Uh, it supports transactions. In other words, you can start a transaction inside of the store procedure, do some stuff, um, and then commit the, uh, the transaction. Uh, however, you cannot ever use a store procedure in an SQL statement that, that's part of a join. And uh, the syntax, let me, I think I've got a better example in here than I'm not a big fan of how this was written originally. Uh, store procedures are declared using uh, DDL. It's create procedure. You give it a name, series of parameters. You put in a begin statement that says this is the actual code. It does some code. There's an end. Each parameter specification has a option of in, out, or in, out. And then the parameter name and the type. I've actually got examples in the slides. Um, in mode means a value passes into the procedure via that parameter. Out mode means it'll pass a value back out via that parameter. In out means it can come in and out. Um, so we're going to use two tables here as an example. Uh, employees and departments. Uh, this is roughly what the data looks like. And we want to keep track of the total salaries of employees for working for each department. So we're going to create a new table called department salaries. And I know we could do this as a view or as a join or as a regular query, but let's say you're a really large corporation with tens of thousands of employees. 
those queries could run for a bit. So you actually store the stuff in a table. Um, so in this table, we have um, the department number and a total salary. The total salary defaults to zero. So we're going to write a procedure that updates the salaries. So the very first thing you need to do is we need to change the delimiter. This is actually the one of the weird MySQL things because um, this is this is a MySQL specific quirk when it comes to um, store procedures and functions and triggers. You have to tell MySQL to start ignoring semicolons because when when you write an SQL statement, what's the end of statement character? Semicolon. So now you're going to want to write three or four SQL statements, but it sees the semicolon, so it says, huh, I'm done now, and it ignores anything else because of the semicolon. So what you need to do is you need to change the end of command character. You can make it almost anything you want. So MySQL has a magical command called delimiter. Before you write your store procedure or your function, you change the delimiter to something else. In this case, we're going to change it to double slash. So the command would be delimiter double slash. Um, and I'm going to zoom into this because this is really small. Here's our sample parameter. Can I move that over a bit? Yeah, close enough. We got most of it. So we change the delimiter to double slash. We're going to go create procedure, give it a name, just like you would for a function. You see there's an in parameter, int. So that means it's going to take a single parameter. It's going to be called param1. It's going to be an integer. It's You're going to begin. So um, most SQL implementations that have programming capability for triggers and functions, that kind of stuff, they, they do something called block level programming, where you encapsulate the code in a block, and the block is begin and end. Uh, some database servers allow you to have nested blocks, like Postgres. You can have multiple blocks, one inside the other, so you can skip over entire blocks. Um, very, like, basic, like, language. Basic. Not basic isn't simple. Um, so begin. So now we're going to create an SQL statement that reads, um, update department salary, set the total salary equal to... Then it's going to select the sum of the salary for employee where the department number is equal to the parameter. Where the department number is equal to the parameter. It's a really hard to read query. Uh, but essentially, we're doing a subquery, produce math, and we end it. Yeah? So basically, if you called the, the procedure and then you put, like, for example, five. It would, I would add up all the salaries to department number five. Okay, so basically it's like Python where you're calling a function by putting in the, the parameter. Yeah, yeah, that's just like a function, but this is a store procedure. It doesn't return a value. It runs and ends. So then the next thing you'll notice is that we have the end keyword here with the semicolon. You'll notice there's a semicolon here, there's a semicolon here, and then our, our double slash. So what it's saying is, until you see the double slash, just ignore the semicolons, because it needs, SQL needs to know the semicolons are there, because that's separating the different commands. But the problem is that if I didn't replace the semicolon with something else, um, it would go create procedure, begin the update, it would hit that semicolon, and then try to create the procedure. And you'd be missing the end statement, therefore the code would be invalid, which is why we have to say, hey, the end of command command character is not semicolon until we're done. So I, I, I that what's saying on the slide to the left of that code example is what I just described. Then we want to do one last thing, which is change uh, the delimiter back to being semicolon because we want to let our SQL code work like it normally would. Um, so you'll see delimiter double slash, the create procedure, it's terminated by a double slash, then we change the delimiter back to semicolon so that our SQL code continues behaving right. Um, oh, come on. Where is it? Here. Oh, yo. I'll drop it on the floor. So then you'd call the procedure. And as he was saying, you know, I go call space update salary one. You'll notice it says zero rows affected even though theoretically it is updating rows somewhere. 
It's saying zero row is affected because it's executing a procedure. The procedure is affecting the rows, but the query itself is only calling the procedure. Therefore, the pr calling the procedure doesn't affect the rows. Whatever the procedure does happens in the background. So the SQL, like MySQL, doesn't actually know how many rows were affected. Sometimes. Sometimes it will. And it depends on the version, which is nice. When we used to run this course on SQL 5, MySQL 5.6, it always returned with zero rows affected. When 5.7 came along, it started telling us sometimes that a row was affected. On 8, I think it usually tells you a row was affected. Um, every other database server on Earth, other than MySQL, will always tell you the rows are affected. It's MySQL being MySQL. So we would call a procedure to update the total salary for each department. One, two, three, and it creates that. So then if we were to look at the data, I don't know why there's a green box on that slide. That's cute. Um, you'd see that department one has a total, department two has a total, department three has a total. And life is good. It, do we got a store procedure that does it? Um, in uh, MySQL, you can run a command that's called show procedure status. It shows you the name of the procedures, but not the code in it. Um, it's kind of cute because students in my other class ask me also, how do you see the contents of a view? And I go, I use the GUI and I right click and I go all through view and it shows me the view. Um, in MySQL, if you use MySQL Workbench, you can actually edit the procedure in the editor and it'll load up the procedure in a nice GUI to show you what all the options are. Um, it is possible to extract the code. Obviously, if the GUI tool can do it, you can do it by hand. I don't know the commands anymore. It's been so long since I've had to do it that I don't remember them. Um, and as always, if we want to get rid of the store procedure, we can go drop procedure and it just goes away. And with everything else in SQL, it doesn't ask you if you're sure. So, you know, be careful. Um, so some cool features that you can do in store procedures. Um, you can declare variables. So just like in Python, you declare variables, you do the same thing in MySQL. Uh, we have if then else. Uh, we have loops such as while and repeat. Um, there's no for loop in MySQL. There's for loops in uh, Postgres, but there's no for loop in MySQL. You only have while. Um, MySQL also supports cursors. Uh, and there's going to be an example in a minute about cursors. However, um, before I usually recommend this, before you do the lab, you'll notice I have a link on the slide. Go do that link. It's going to make your labs way easier. Uh, the MySQL tutorial is mysqltutorial.org is fantastic. Um, so a cursor is a query that is stored inside the procedure that you can loop on the results. So um, have they gotten you to connect to a database yet using Python? Yes. Okay. And you know, you define your query, you execute your query, you loop as you fetch records, and usually you feed the records into an array. That's a cursor. But it's known as a cursor because it's happening inside the database, not outside the database. So when you're doing that exact procedure in the database, it's known as a cursor. So what it's doing is it, it runs a query, it stores the results in memory, and then you basically have a cursor that points to each row and you're looping through each row. Um, if I were to compare it to C, it's as if you're working with pointers. Um, not a good time. So we're gonna change our function that we just had so that we're gonna be using a cursor. So instead of um, having to run so let's say there's five departments. We have to run the query five times. We had a sixth department, and nobody told the person that runs that store procedure every night that there's a sixth department. Department six has a total salary of zero because nobody knows they need to run it. So what we want to do is we want to change our store procedure we had before so that it doesn't need to know about a specific department. So the code looks like this. And this one's long compared to what we just were just looking at, but this example has everything in it. 
And this example has everything you need in it to do. It shows you everything you need to know how to do. Store procedures, functions, and almost triggers in this one example. All right, so we have, we set our delimiter. This time we decided to get clever and we did double dollar signs instead of double slashes. It's just to show that the delimiter doesn't really mean anything. You just have to make sure it's not something that the SQL server will recognize. Create procedure, update salary. You notice we took off the parameter because we don't want to have to tell it which department we're doing. We have our begin and we have our end at the end. Let's go to the safe side. We're going to declare a couple of variables. Declare done as an integer, defaults to zero. So that would be, um, man, if, was, if you guys were programming in PHP, I could give you examples in PHP off the top of my head. I haven't wrote in. done equals zero. Yeah, pretty much. Int done equals zero. Then we have declare current denum int. So that would be uh, int denum equals null because it sets it basically as a null value. Um, now we're going to do two more declares, but you'll notice that these are kind of funny. Declare denum cur is, in other words, a department number cursor as a cursor. So we're declaring it as an object. Instead of being a data type, a cursor is an object. For, and then you'll notice there's an SQL statement behind it. So we're saying, so in Python, this would be the equivalent of SQL equals quote mark, uh, select D number from department depth sal, close quotes. So what we're doing is we're declaring a cursor for that query. Then, and this is where MySQL is extra dumb. Because MySQL doesn't understand the concept of we've reached the end of records. So we're going to declare, and it's called continue. We're going to declare a continue handler for not found set done equal to one. So in every other language, like for example, in PHP, if I wanted to loop through a series of records, I go while, and I'm assuming it's the same thing in Python, while, in parentheses, row equals fetch next row, it'll loop until it stops fetching and then it returns a false, so the loop ends. MySQL's uh, loop syntax doesn't understand that. It has no way to actually know you've reached end of rows. So what you do is you actually declare an error handler to say when we hit an error of record not found, we're going to do this instead. So it's going to declare a continue handler. So this is a continue handler for not found. In other words, record not found, we're going to set the done variable that we declared up here to one. So instead of generating an error, we're going to set uh, try catch fail. Does that ring a bell? Same idea as doing a try catch. You're going to go, I'm going to try to fetch a row. If it fails, I'm going to set this variable instead. So that's the equivalent of a try catch. Um, not very elegant, but it is what it is. So open the num cursor. So this in Python would be the equivalent of you actually doing an execute on the SQL that you define in your variable. So. At this point, you do open denum cursor. The um, database server runs a query to find the cursor as. Hasn't done anything yet. It's just, it runs to make sure the query can run. Just like, you know, you execute your query in Python, the query runs. It doesn't return all the rows right away. It just runs. And, you know, you might get a resource ad. Hoping I get this right. You might get a resource handle, you might get an error, you might get something else coming out of that, trying to run that SQL statement. This tries to run the SQL statement. Then we start a loop, repeat. And we're going to close the loop because I'm actually going to go down here and go until done and repeat. So until done, in other words, as long as done is equal to zero, it's just going to keep looping. The second done becomes one, it stops looping because MySQL, of course, doesn't have proper Booleans. It has zero and one. So until done changes, it's just gonna keep looping. So then we're gonna go fetch the cursor into current denum. Update department salary, set the total salary equal to, and because we already, we fetched the cursor. So that again, in Python is when you do a, a, uh, a, a fetch of the record. So, you know, you ran the query, 
and then you do a while you're fetching each row, you're going to do something. That's what that's doing right here. It's going to fetch the results of the query into that variable. It's going to use that variable. It's going to keep looping. And then you have to be a good little citizen and you close your cursor. Hopefully whoever taught you guys how to talk to a database using Python told you guys about closing your database connections. You don't want to leave your database connections dangling. Uh, it's not nice. And then you end it. And then you reset your delimiter. So in the end, we could just go update, call update salary, and it'll do the same thing where we had to do three calls before. This time, it'll do all of them in one go. So we never need to know how many departments there are. But the function takes care of it, or the uh, store procedure takes care of it. Um, now, if you wanted to create a procedure to give a raise to all employees, we're going to do a few more examples. Um, this is almost the exact same thing as the last one. So I'm not going to go through in details about declaring each of the variables. But what is interesting is you notice I declared an employee ID and a salary. And I'm fetching the employee record into ED, EID and salary. Because you'll notice in the cursor, I've got two columns. So I can actually fetch the two columns into two variables. So essentially, if you have two columns in your cursor, you can fetch into two variables every single time. So every time you loop, it'll populate those two variables. Um, in other programming languages like Python or PHP, normally you'd retrieve the entire row. It comes to you as an array, and you're grabbing each of the pieces of the array. Um, there's no arrays in this. So you just fetch into each of the items. You're going to update the salary. So you're going to say update employees. That's salary equal to the salary because we retrieved it here. And then we're going to, you know, increase the salary by the amount, uh, round it, and then set wherever the ID matches whatever we pulled here. Until done, because, you know, we had the good old handler, we got to the end of it. Now try catch fail, and it bombs out, and it's done. So if we wanted to call it, we could go give everybody a 10% raise. And it would just increase everybody's salaries by 10% as applicable. And it would round them. Okay, so those are stored procedures. There's a few other things about stored procedures that you should know. Um, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a slide for this at the end, but I don't remember, so I'm going to talk about it. Stored procedures are normally used for maintenance. So nightly cleaning, uh, cleaning out log files, uh, summarizing data, preparing... Um, Materialized views, which MySQL does not have. Um, at least I think it doesn't. It didn't last year. So maybe the new version does. I don't know. Uh, updating your materialized views. Um, updating inventory. That kind of stuff. Like it's for, Usually store procedures are for maintenance tasks. It's not something you do all the time, every, all the, every day. It looks like, it looks complex. But if you take you the time to read through the code, you'll realize that even though the syntax is, is very different from Python, it, it's the exact same concepts, just the syntax is different. So if you're trying to figure out how to write a stored procedure or a function in, in the database, think about how you'd write it in Python. Well, obviously without any of the object orientation, if you guys did, ob did object orientation, and then you want to translate the same concepts into the database and then apply the technique the database wants you to use. All right, functions. So MySQL has a bunch of predefined functions. Um, concat, substring, cast, you know, convert date time. There's all kinds, uh, sum, min, max, those kinds of functions. Those are all functions. It has piles of functions built in. However, you can create your own functions. Um, by creating our own function, we can extend the capabilities of our database. Um, the difference between a function and a server procedure is that a function is compiled at runtime. So every single time you call it, the database server compiles it. So guys, you realize that Python can either be interpreted or compiled, right? Did they tell you the difference that it can do both? So you can compile your... Python application, so it becomes a binary blob that's then executed. And if you pre-compile it, it doesn't need to keep compiling it every time you try to run it. It runs the pre-compiled one. Uh, that usually you'd see that as a PYC file, um, or it could be interpreted where it reads it every it 
it literally reads the entire script every time you run it, figures out if it can run it. So a store procedure is like a compiled program and executable. A function is like a script that gets interpreted every single time you call it. Um, functions have a return type and they can only ever return one value, which with the store procedure, you can have in and out parameters. So that means you can have multiple values coming out. A function can have many parameters coming in, but only ever one thing coming out. So it's just like a function in Python. Uh, they only support select statements, um, has input parameters. Um, theoretically, you can't use them with transactions. In other database servers, yes, you can. In MySQL, maybe in version 8. Uh, this slide probably hasn't been updated recently. Uh, you can use them in join clauses. That's not a problem. Um, common functions I've seen people create is a function to create a unique key for a, for a person. <laughs> so when you store database records for people, often you want to salt their records. Like if you're encrypting any of the data, you want to salt it. And as you create the initial record, you might want to create that salt the first time. So you create a function or you might want to create a function that creates an API key or a unique identifier of some sort. Um, those are some of the functions I've seen done. So functions are declared and there's the, you know, the really gross way of reading it. Um, and I don't know why the pram specs there because it shouldn't be there. Uh, you need an admin privilege to create functions, obviously. I am just going to show you guys how to do a function instead of showing the other thing. So again, changing the delimiter. And once again, we decided to use something different just to make sure it's different than you realize it can be used. Create function, give raise. And then we've got old value double, amount double, and there's actually should be a closing parentheses, but it's cut off by the slide. Returns double. So it's saying I'll take two parameters coming in. They're both doubles. And it'll return a double. The next line you'll see is deterministic. And deterministic is a really interesting thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a slide for it a bit later. Uh, but since it's on the screen, I'll talk about it. Deterministic means if you feed the same arguments twice in a row, it doesn't execute the second one. It returns whatever the one before it did. It caches the results. So you have deterministic and non-deterministic. So when it's deterministic, it means that, let's say I feed in value one, amount two, and it returns whatever it happens to be. And then... A second later, somebody asks for amount one and then value two, it'll return the exact same value. It won't even execute the function because it knows what the result of that is. It caches the results. So it does, it's for performance. So for any function where the math would never change. So in other words, you wrote a function and if you give it a parameter of some sort, it's always going to be the same result. You'd make it as a deterministic. Uh, begin. <laughs> you declare the variable. They're declaring a variable. We set the variable. We return the variable. Just like you would in Python. You end it, and the code is done. Reset the delimiter. And if we were to execute it, uh, actually, we don't have the execute on there. Uh, but if we took a person's salary of uh, 50000 and we say they're getting a raise of... Um, I don't know, 10%. So what it'll do is it'll go old value times 1.1, 1 .1, right? So 1 plus 1 1.0. It would return 10% uh, would give us uh, $50,500. That's how you define a function. There's really not much more to it than that. It's just like a function in Python. So concept's the same, syntax is different. So there's the deterministic keyword, uh, which I said there was a slide for this. Deterministic, it's used when the function always returns the same result for the same input. For example, 2 plus 2 will always be equal to 4. Therefore, there's zero chance of getting another result. So a function that would do that math would be deterministic because four and 2 plus 2 will always be 4. Non-deterministic is used when the output might be different. So for example, I'm trying to create a function that randomly generates a key or a salt. And even though I feed it one parameter, what comes out every time might be different. 
Therefore, it's non-deterministic. Um, so that means that something in the function, there could be like a randomizer of some sort in the function. Um, actually, well, there's the example right here. Select name, salary, give, raise of 10% as new salary. It shows that uh, with a 10% raise, John goes from 100,000 to 110,000. Mary went from 50,000 to 55,000, on and on and on. Uh, it's just doing the math. Okay. All right. Functions versus stored procedures. So a function is compiled at runtime. It's st uh, stored procedures pre-compiled, so it runs faster. Functions are only supported in select statements. You can use them in the where clause depending on what the function does, <laughs> but you can't do it anywhere else. Um, Store procedures can be used in anything, in select, insert, update, delete. Uh, it can only return, function returns one value. Store procedure does not return values, but it can output multiple parameters. So if you define one parameter as an input, two out parameters as output, those variables are going to get set on the way out. Um, functions only have inbound parameters. Store procedures have both. Uh, a function behaves like a method. Um, or a function <laughs> in Python, right? Um, if this we were talking about Java, then it would be known as a as a method. Um, Store procedures act like a script. Uh, functions can be used in joins. Procedures can't. Um, functions cannot be really used in a transaction, depending on what transaction is actually doing. Uh, the sort procedure can be used with a transaction. So. It's generally more desirable to use stored procedures over functions, depending on what it is you're trying to do. Preserved uh, procedures are more flexible, they have more power, they can do more. Um, and stored procedures will also tend to run faster. However, if it's a simple task like calculating 10%, then a function might be more suitable. It just depends. You pick the right tool for the right job. Um, all right. So, which lets me dive into the next one, which is this one. Okay, I tend I want I usually tend to do both these lectures back to back, even though they're really dense uh, concept wise, because triggers just fits right in with the store procedures. It's the same code, it's the same language on the inside. Um, now, the only difference is, is that triggers are event-driven actions. When I was going through college a few years ago, just a few, graduated in 96, so it's a few. When it was, <laughs> you know, a brand new language had just appeared on the horizon. It was taking the business world by storm. It introduced a new concept that nobody had ever done before. It was called event-driven programming. In other words, programming that responds to what users are doing on screen. Anybody here want to take a guess what the language was? JavaScript? No, God, no. Browsers didn't even exist yet. Browse like Mosaic was like at version 0.6 beta at that point. Okay. No, Java wasn't a thing either. Give us a hint. It's now no longer a language that's used commonly. It still exists in business. No, COBOL is not event-driven. Are you ready? Ruby was invented like 10 years ago. It came, it was amazing, and then it died. Visual Basic. Well, people are like, oh, Visual Basic. Now, put yourself in the shoes of a programmer where up till then, there was no such thing as event-driven programming. Click on a button, double click on an icon, click on a toolbar. And when you're writing code, you're not writing an entire application, you're just writing code that responds to that event. Visual Basic got replaced by C Sharp. So C Sharp, you know, Visual Studio with C Sharp basically replaced it. Um, and it still has a whole, you know, event driven paradigm. So what's cool about event-driven programming is it's programming that acts in response to events. For example, you click a mouse on a button. 
you double click, triple click, right click, shift, right click, shift, left click. You know, those are all different events you could capture. In the database, there are events that happen. Some database servers support more events than others. MySQL is a little, little special. Uh, it only supports very specific ones. However, every database server that supports triggers has six moments that can be captured. So six events that can be captured. And the three triggering events is insert, update, and delete. Because insert, update, and delete change something. It's an event that modifies. And for each of those events, you have the option of doing a before or after. And you can, you can also have both. So you can have a trigger that before the insert happens, this code executes. After this insert happens, this code executes. And depending on the database server, uh, a trigger may or may not be part of the transaction. I put that point in the slide myself. Previous prof did not. Uh, that's because MySQL is special and its triggers are not transaction safe. Other database servers, the triggers are transaction safe. Um, so events that derive triggers, as soon as these commands are executed, the listener will ensure that the trigger runs. So there's something in the database server that's listening and it says, oh, I just got a DML command that's doing an update. Hey, they're, modif they're updating table A. So what it'll do is go, hey, table A, do you have any triggers for me? Well, obviously the table A doesn't answer that way, but it basically looks at the structure of the database and says, oh, is there any triggers here? Oh, there's a before trigger. So let's execute the before trigger before we actually put the data in the table. And then it says, oh, we've managed to actually get the stuff written to the table. Is there an after trigger? Should we be doing something after this succeeded? So these are six events. You have before insert, which is before the data is inserted into the table. So data comes in. It's not written to the table yet. We can do, we can actually modify the data. So we can actually create, modify, like we could add timestamps. We could uh, remove invalid values. We could do all kinds of things to it. After insert, the data has been inserted into the database, into the table. It can no longer be modified. However, we may want to log the fact that it succeeded somewhere else. So we still have access to all the data we just put in but we can't modify it anymore because it's already been physically written to the disk. Before update, same idea. Before the data gets updated to the disk, we can do things to the update. After update, ditto. Uh, before delete, after delete, you know. We actually do a before delete, check to see if the data is allowed to be deleted. And if it's not allowed to be deleted, it actually raise an error and actually cause the command to fail. Or, you could use a before delete to do your cascade to kill the kids. Sorry, the child records. <laughs> yeah. You had a question? Well, well that's, I'm not going to block that out. I've, yeah, I've been using that phrase for years. I decided it on purpose. <laughs> yes, it will respect permissions. So the trigger will execute with whatever permissions you have. So if you're not allowed to insert, update, or delete, it'll actually block even before the trigger happens. It'll say, oh, they're trying to insert into table A. They're not allowed to insert into table A. So those are your six events. Um, if those events don't occur, the trigger won't execute, obviously. If you're not doing an insert, therefore the insert trigger will never fire. Um, there are statements that execute these events behind the scenes, uh, replace low data, for example, we'll use insert and update statements and they will cause triggers to run. So there are server side commands that can cause triggers to fire. Um, so low data is commonly used in MySQL to load data from a file. Um, like one of my jobs, I don't know if I told you this group, but, uh, we, 
we used to collect data from different liquor boards across Canada, and we'd summarize it for a wine company that sells wine. They had us, you know, collecting data from the SAQ, from the LCBO, from the Alberta Liquor Board, and and we'd take, you know, oh, this kind of wine, they sold 26 bottles yesterday. That's in Quebec. We could get daily totals in Quebec. In Ontario, they were weekly. Alberta was monthly. We'd run it once a month. Give us the last month's sales. And we used the low data as part of it. We'd had a SIR procedure. We'd run the SIR procedure. It would look at the disk. SIR procedure would actually try to do a load data from an existing file. And it would load it right into the database. Every single, the low data would actually fire off insert statements for every single, every single time it ran. So you have to be aware that there might be commands that it's not your users running that could cause the triggers to fire off. So you have to be aware if, you know, if you're using replace or low data or some of the other commands that might do this kind of stuff, that it might fire off the triggers. So when I got a chart, oh yeah, it's, it's gonna be really hard to read on the screen. Actually, it's not too bad in this room. Um, so there's a few things that, that happen, series of events, and I'll show you guys that on chart in a second. Uh, with every single trigger execute, there's two data structures that get created, new and old. Um, so new contains any new values being pushed into the database. So if you're doing an insert or an update, you're obviously putting in new data. So there's an object in memory called new. It looks like a table. You know how you can go select, select uh, airports.name from airports? and it knows to grab the name from the airport. If you're using it in a trigger, you can go new dot name, and it would give you the new value being put into the name field. Old is what was there before. So if you're doing an update or a delete, it's gonna retrieve whatever's being affected for that row into memory. So then you can actually go, if new name not equal to old name, then do this. So you can actually compare the old values and the new values as part of the function. And I've got a whole story to, about this one uh, that I experienced years ago. And um, I'll exp it'll make a bit of sense when I, sh when I go through with you guys. So here's the entire flow of a transaction, and then, sorry, an insert, update, or delete. Um, so if you've got the slides, it's probably easier to read on your own little screen than it is on that big screen. It's in the... Um, I wonder if I can zoom in a little bit, try to make it a little more readable. Yeah, okay, good. SQL command is received. So at this point, some sort of SQL statement was sent to the SQL server, MySQL. MySQL interpreter reads it, goes, hey, I got a command, yay for me. Is it a manipulation command? In other words, is it an insert, update, or delete? Yes or no? If it's no, it just executes the query, returns the results, it's happy, it did its job. It's a manipulation command. Insert, update, or delete. It goes, did it parse correctly? In other words, is it a valid command? You didn't send me something with syntax error. Uh, if it didn't parse correctly, it raises an error. It parsed correctly, great. It goes, is there a before trigger? Yes, it executes it. No, obviously it doesn't execute it because it doesn't exist. And it goes, did the trigger execute correctly? Yes or no? If it fails, you get an error. If it succeeded, then it proceeds to actually execute the command. So it'll actually do the insert, the update, or the delete. It finished it, it worked, it's great. So did the insert, update, delete succeed? Yes or no? If it doesn't, it goes to the red box. If it worked, it goes this. Is there an after trigger? Is there something I should do after this succeeded? Yes or no? Um, if it exists, it'll try to execute it. And again, did it execute correctly? If it fails, it raises an error. And this is where MySQL has a big gotcha. And I'll explain that one in a moment. Um, then it outputs the results, returns the results to the client. And life is good. Now, this is where MySQL has one very big difference to every other database server that I've worked with. Command comes in. 
It first. It runs the before trigger. Then excuse the trigger. Trigger shits the bed. Great. It bombs out. Fantastic. Every database server does that. It first, okay. Trigger happens. It executes. It succeeds. Inserts the row. That succeeds. After trigger fires. Does it run? Did it succeed? Yes or no? This right here is where MySQL is different. Even if the after trigger fails, if the insert statement worked, the data is still in the database. You will get an error that something failed, even though the insert worked. You can see how that could cause some problems, right? You're literally, it's the database server saying, bruh, this did not work. And it doesn't say, hey, by the way, I still did the job you asked me to do. It just, as far as I'm concerned, it didn't work. Triggers in MySQL are not transaction safe. In other words, if you do this in Postgres, in Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server, if the after trigger fails, the whole thing rolls back which is why we talk about triggers after transactions. If any of this literally before anything from between here and here fails, every other database server will roll back and say, something went horribly wrong. Sorry, I can't do that for you. MySQL goes, oh, that worked. Oh, good, I was able to write it in the database. Oh, good, this is permanent. Oh, this didn't work, her dirt, it's okay, it crashed. But it's in the database. Um, and it doesn't tell you that it's there. So then you try to execute it a second time because in every other database server, that's how you write the code, right? You'd go, okay, let's try put an error handler. Maybe we need to fix a variable or something and let's try firing it off second time. Or error message comes back from the, from the database server. You raise an error message in the client. The customer goes, save again. Guess what happens that time? It writes it again and it crashes again. Suddenly the customer's creating duplicate records all the time for crap. That doesn't, doesn't show at all that pisses me off, eh? Um, it's, MySQL is really bad for that. MySQL has triggers. It doesn't handle them gracefully. So as long, the only catch is, is if you have an after trigger, you can't, and if it, there's potential for the after trigger to fail, you can't trust that the whole thing works. So then you actually have, if you get an error from an insert, you have to actually check to see if it actually worked or not. So you have to write extra code to handle it in MySQL. Um, now, advantages of triggers. Uh, they can be used to catch errors, obviously. The, in, the before insert, before update, before delete. You can actually get it to do some logic checks in the database to make sure that you know things that are supposed to happen are actually going to happen. Um, you can use it as a method to schedule tasks. Um, in one of our databases at work, I was really lazy. And I, I can't believe I'm gonna admit I did it this way. So every time somebody logs into this application, we create a login log, right? We, we do an entry saying that this person logged in from this IP address at this time. Pretty standard fare. Uh, but I needed to schedule a job the first time an employee logs in every day. I created an after insert trigger for that table. And the logic literally says, okay, now I'm gonna run these three tasks and update this one row to say it's run today. Done. I didn't need to schedule any jobs. The database takes care of it because after the first person logs in of the day, I fire off some code using a trigger. It's elegant yet very lazy and terrible because there's only two of us that know where this code actually lives. It's not in the application anywhere. It's like stuff happens and they don't know why it's happening, but it's in the ad base, it's cool. Um, so another big advantage of triggers is the ability to keep records of changes to a table. So for example, let's just say you have someone who compromises your database server and they start running insert and update commands. And that's because they're running actual SQL commands through you know, some command prompt. It's bypassing the application, the application security, the application's logging tools. 
if you have triggers that keep track of the fact that the records are changing, that's something the person that's running those commands probably isn't aware of. Therefore, at least you're able to keep track of an audit of that stuff change and what it used to be and what it became. Um, you can also use it to do integrity checks. You're going to do a before delete. And you delete the child records. And then again, this is another case where MySQL is, is weird. So you have, you know, parent table, some child records. You want to delete the parent record and you don't have it set up to cascade. You could go use the trigger to delete the child records and then delete the parent record. And the problem with this is the trigger fires off, deletes the child records, it fails to delete the parent record. Suddenly the parent has no kids and the parent's still alive. You didn't manage to kill the family. I use these examples because people really, you know, you remember these examples. Um, so the catch with that is uh, it's good for doing that. And actually back in the day, that's literally how you did parent-child relationship cleanup in MySQL. Before we actually had proper foreign keys, there was a time where MySQL didn't even do foreign keys properly. That's literally how you did on Cascade. You'd write a trigger. So we had triggers before you had proper foreign keys. Explain that one to me. And it would cascade. You could use the triggers to cascade and delete the child records. Uh, would I do that really in the real world? No, but you can. Um, disadvantages of triggers. Of course, for all good things, nothing comes, nobody gets to eat for free. There is... Overhead. Every single time a trigger fires off, it adds a slight delay. Why? Because it's got to execute code. So now you're going to add, I don't know, 1,000 rows. And you have a before and an after trigger. It's going to fire off each of those triggers 1,000 times. So for every single insert, you're going to fire off two extra commands, plus all the logic that goes in whatever's in that trigger, right? Um, and the other issue is that it's invoked from actions on the client side and it might not provide all the information regarding the server side. So it's opaque as in the application that's call, talking to the database doesn't know that something actually happened. It's blind. Um, how many of you have places where you use a key card? You tap to get in and out of places, right? Or, you know, at work where you tap, tap in, tap out to say you started work or whatever. Every time you tap, you know it's creating a record in a database somewhere, right? You might not, you might actually not, but as a person, you go, beep, oh good, the door open, I can go in. You're not thinking every single time you tap that, that the fact that they're logging, you're walking in, you're walking out of that space. But that's the same idea, right? The server is doing stuff, but you're not aware of what it's doing. Same idea. That's a disadvantage of a trigger. Um, yeah, I only got nine slides for triggers. So there is a little more to triggers than just that. At least I, is that the last one? No, it's just my clicker's dead again. Great. Okay. So triggers have limitations. Uh, you cannot create triggers on show, load, uh, backup, restore, flush, return. Uh, they can't be used in transactions or statements that, in, that have commits and rollbacks. And it has a lock table. Uh, if you do a lock table, it will actually cause the trigger to crash because it can't do what it's supposed to do. Um, however, you will notice there's a big green, whatever the heck that is on the site says, this only applies to MySQL. Other database servers have way more functionality on their triggers. For example, Postgres, you could create a trigger on a select statement and run something called instead of. You go select star from customers. It looks at there's a select statement trigger and it goes, instead of doing that, I want you to do this instead. And it'll actually, you can actually get it to write a different, it can actually override the SQL statement. What is that used for? Often it's used when your table structure has changed, but you have an old application and you need that application to always see the data the same way. Or you're trying to hide parts of, for example, you're storing credit card information in that table and you need the credit card information to not be encrypted because you need to run the card numbers. But somebody goes, select star from credit cards. You could actually have the trigger garble or 
uh, hide the um, credit card number, but only if it's selected a certain way, which is cool. Um, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, DB2, and I think Postgres, I'm not sure. Actually, you can create table, you can actually have triggers on create, alter, and drop. So you can have a before create, an after create, and actually log the fact that tables are created or dropped. It's kind of cool. Uh, some nifty features there. All right, so syntax time. Uh, it's create trigger name. You say the timing and the event. There's going to be an example in a second. On the table, there's a line there called for on each row. And when I bring up the example, I will um, explain what that does. Trigger names must be unique for each table. So you could use the same trigger name on multiple tables. I usually don't recommend you use the same trigger name on multiple tables. You should probably try to make that trigger name unique to each table. That way it makes it easier to keep track of what the trigger does. Here's a sample. And this sample actually leads into my story. So delimiter double dollar sign. So that's something you saw earlier today. Create trigger, product serial number log. After update on a table called products for each row. And then I got to begin. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. So this creates a trigger if there's an update on the table. Yeah, after an update succeeds. So if the update was successful, it was able to write it to the disk. It's going to fire that trigger. For each row means for every row being affected. So if you did a, a update products set serial number to ABC without a where clause, it is going to affect every row. So what it, what the trigger will do is for every row being affected, it'll fire that off. So it's on a per row basis. Uh, you can choose to exclude for each row, and that's known as a uh, table level, not a row level trigger. That means that it'll fire off after it's done doing updating all the rows. So you could actually just have a single command that runs after everything is done. Not very common, but you can. Begin. And here you get to see a bit of uh, other kind of syntax that you hadn't seen yet. If old serial number is not equal to the new serial number, then. Um, if anybody here has ever seen basic, the language, this looks very familiar. Because that's how you write an if statement in basic. Then insert it into the log. You'll notice old ID, old name, old serial number, now, and the kind of entry, and if, and the function. So what it's doing here is it's looking at the original serial number log that was in the table before the update fired, and what the new value being passed in is. If the serial number changed, then it adds a log entry. Maybe we don't care about any other fields other than the serial number. Therefore, we don't want to insert a log for every necessarily every time something changes on the product. We just want to worry about when the serial number changes. And this is a very close example to a trigger I wrote at work. And I mean, we're talking like, it's fine, it was written for Postgres, so the syntax is slightly different. But this trigger is like 90% the same. So years ago, we launched an online registration system where a person could load up a web page and register their software. And this was written in the age where bad people existed on the internet, but they weren't really a big thing. Like, not like now where, you know, you put up a page that's not secure, you're going to compromise in like 10 minutes. So at one point, I get a call and saying, hey, Dan, we noticed that serial numbers are changing in the database. I'm like, Really? Yeah, and they're invalid values, but these values are being fed from the application. So how are they changing to something that would never be seen in the application? I'm like, I have no idea. Let me go investigate. I look and true enough, serial numbers are changing and they're changing sequentially. Product one, serial number changed. Product two, serial number changes. Product three, I'm like, somebody's got a bot that's hitting our site. Um, so I identified that they were coming from the Netherlands and then we banned the Netherlands completely as a country uh, that day, temporarily, for about two months. 
Um, we didn't have a lot of customers in the Netherlands, so it was a moot point at that point. So we just banned in the Netherlands so that we could stop it. Um, and then I wrote a trigger that would log every single time a serial number would change to whatever was there before so that if we got compromised again, I could go look at what the serial number was and restore the data. So this cat and mouse game lasted years. He'd find a way in. I'd close the hole. Two weeks later, he's back at it again. I'd close the hole. Um, it got to the point where registration system was rock solid. Like he just gave up. Uh, what he was doing is because our software is controlled with license files that are encrypted. He was feeding known values into the database, and then this, the website would feed a license file back. So he's feeding known values, trying to figure out what. That's how you figure out. That's how you crack encryption, right? You have a known value and you feed it into the encryption algorithm, and then you look for a pattern. So, you know, he was constantly looking for a pattern coming out of the files. He never would have gotten it, but, you know, he was welcome to try. So I ended up creating a trigger that keeps track. So the one in our database server not only tracks what the old serial number was, it also tracks what the command was that ran it. So the update or the insert statement, we would know what command it was so I can then I could go crawl through all the code and go figure out how these turn, you know, well, this is the update statement that did it this time. So go search through, grep through the code and try to find out what happened. So yes, I, triggers are very useful. <laughs> I used a trigger to find patterns in what this guy was doing by logging all this. We're still logging to this day, even though our system's significantly more secure than it ever was. Why? It's good to know what they used to be, especially if somebody screws up. Um, yeah, that cat and mouse game lasted seven years. Yeah, seven years until he gave up. Uh, our guess was that he was being paid by some company to crack or, or license files. In the end, they, they actually decompiled their application instead. That was easier than figuring out how to decrypt or license files. So that's okay. That's just the cat and mouse game with crackers, right? Um, notice I didn't say the word hacker. Those are crackers. Um, so in a trigger, you can raise errors. So you know how in Python, you can literally raise an error, trigger an error, even though there's no error, you can choose to fail. Um, in PHP, the command is called die. <laughs> die, you give it a string and it comes back with, hey, this failed. Um, well, we got much more elegant ways than that, but die is the old command we used to use. In MySQL, it's called single, a signal SQL state. Uh, 45,000 means um, it's an error. It's an actual hard failure, not a warning. Uh, you can give it a different number and it will give you different error levels. You can check the documentation for all those. You go set message text equal to no, 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 no deleting the log data. It ends delimiter. So if you try to delete from the log file, it actually returns a hard fail with a custom error message saying, hey, you're not allowed to do this. Instead of being one of those ever so useful MySQL error messages, which I'm sure you've all experienced by now, just how useful some of them are. This was like, bro, you're not allowed to do this. And I, I do have some triggers that are very close to that wording, like a couple of tables where unless the delete is being triggered a very specific way, it literally says, no, you're not allowed to just go away. Um, you know, the, the only people who would see that are people that aren't supposed to see it. So, you know, that's okay. Yeah, All right. Turn or something. Eh? Turn or something. No, an intern will never have direct access to the database. Never. They will have their own copy of the database to play with. Any change they're planning to do gets vetted. Intern does not get to play. At the bank, would they let you modify the banking data directly? Yeah. Same. They won't even let it play close to the server. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Same. Um, so that is technically the content for last week and this week. Next week, I'm going to do a quick review of what's on the exam. Uh, it's a paper exam. Um, Wednesday at 3.30 p.m., if I recall correctly. Hang on. I am going to go confirm that. And odds are somebody's going to come up with it before I will. Yeah, access for teachers looks really different than access for students. 
Um, it's also really slow. Uh, 8250 final assessment. Yes. Uh, August 16th at 3.30 in the afternoon in B170. Everybody's favorite stupid lecture hall. Uh, this should be showing up for you guys in Access also. So if you log into Access and you go to the end of your timetable, it'll show you your assessments and where they're at. Um, yeah, congratulations. You guys are going to have a nice you know, mid-afternoon exam. This is my other group. Look at when they're writing. Saturday at 9 a.m. Sucks to be them. I even said that to them today. It sucks to be you guys. 9 a.m. on Saturday. Don't be late because we're not going to let you in. Uh, B170. Now I'll be putting out an announcement with that stuff next week. So, so next week will be a quick review. I will give you guys a complete demo of some triggers so you can actually see them happening. Uh, but you technically have everything you need to finish the labs now. The, la the last, the triggers and the stuff we're asking you guys to do are not complicated. Don't panic. If you've read the lab instructions, they're pretty straightforward. All right.